Now I will introduce our lunch speaker, Dr. Bruce Hillman, who is going to talk to us about too much of a good thing, the uncritical use of medical imaging. Dr. Hillman is a professor of radiology and public health sciences at the University of Virginia. He was chair of the Department of Radiology from 1992 to 2003. He now serves as both the founder and chief scientific officer of ACR Image Metrics, a contract research organization owned by the American College of Radiology since 2007, and as founding editor of the Journal of the American College of Radiology since 2003. During 1999 to 2007, he was the founding PI and chair of the American College of Radiology Imaging Network, commonly known as Akron, an NCI-funded clinical trials cooperative group that conducted more than 30 multi-center studies of imaging under his leadership, and you heard a report on that uh, this morning. And, uh, Dr. Hillman was educated at Princeton University and the University of Rochester. He received his radiology training at the Peter Brent Brigham Hospital. He trained in health services research and policy at the RAND Corporation as a Pew Fellow during 1984 to 1985. His first appointment was at the University of Arizona. Dr. Hillman has published 176 peer-reviewed journal articles and more than 140 book chapters, review articles, editorials, and texts. His book with Jeff Goldsmith, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, How Medical Imaging is Changing Healthcare, was published by Oxford University Press in 2010. He has presented more than 40 honorary lectures, including both the RSNA Pendergrass New Horizons Lecture and the American Rankin Race Society Caldwell Lecture. His research into self-referral for diagnostic imaging altered AMA ethics policies and in influenced federal and state legislation. Dr. Hillman has been president of five radiologic societies and is a member of the American College of Radiology Board of Chancellors since 1995. Dr. Hillman was editor-in-chief of Investigative Radiology and was the founding editor-in-chief of Academic Radiology. Among the many honors Dr. Hillman has received are honorary fellowship in the French Society of Radiology, the Royal Australian and New Ze Zealand College of Radiology, and the Royal College of Radiologists. He was the 2007 RSNA Outstanding Researcher and has received the gold medals of the Association of University Radiologists, the Society of Euroradiology, and the Radiologic Society of North America. We are honored to have Dr. Bruce Hillman present the Steve Libel Memorial Lecture on the topic, Too Much of a Good Thing, the Uncritical Use of Medical Imaging. Dr. Hillman. Thank you. I think I just heard my life flash before my eyes. I'm very grateful for this invitation for a number of reasons. First of all, it's always terrific to uh, get a chance to present in front of the home team, and certainly ACR is my home team. The other is uh, the opportunity to present a lecture memorializing Stephen Libel. Uh, Steve Steve was a remarkable presence, uh, not only for uh, all of the wonderful things that he did that uh, Kimberly mentioned, but also as a great researcher and a wonderful human being. Uh, I was fortunate enough to serve on the Board of Chancellors when Stephen was a member. I am very proud to call him my friend, and I hope that he would have greatly enjoyed this lecture. I do want to mention one other person very quickly because uh, I think he is probably on our minds, uh, Harvey Neiman, who's been recovering from surgery, also a very good friend of many of us, certainly mine, and uh, want to wish him well. All right, this is my outline. I'm going to start by talking about how a perception of overuse and misuse of medical imaging has developed. And you've heard a lot about this, but I hope to present a couple of new insights. Much of it, I feel, has to do with uncritical use. And by the word uncritical, I mean not well considered or perhaps not considered at all before requisition is generated. I'll go on to uh, talk about how uncritical use is making things difficult for us as radiologists, and I'll wrap up, wrap up with opportunities for how we might change the situation. I want to begin with just three premises, 
And I'm hoping you're going to agree with the premises of this talk, or it's going to be a very long 40, 45 minutes. So let me just start right in. Premise number one, it's about the money. People talk about quality of care, improving quality of care by removing misuse of imaging from the table, but we wouldn't be the target that we are if it weren't about the money. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but you can see, particularly during the 2000 to 2006 period, when we did attract so much attention, and then the rapid rise from 3 to 5 percent of all health uh, cost outlays in 1995 to roughly 12 to 15 percent today. The big thing, and I think it is hard to deny, I've seen figures as high as 33 percent of imaging is unnecessary. I don't know that that's the right number, but I think those of you who work day in, day out, recognize that much of what we do does not contribute to the management of patients and ultimately then cannot contribute to health. Premise number two, what I have just talked about in the previous slide and our success has led to an anti-imaging bias on the parts of policymakers and other physicians. No specialty in medicine has enjoyed such an extraordinary sequence of new technologies and new applications of older technologies as radiology. We've had the fun toys more than anybody else. Imaging, because it is less invasive and for a number of other reasons less expensive, at least on a per unit basis, has replaced other procedures. They are jealous of the fact that our incomes have risen faster than theirs. In fact, if you look at most specialties of medicine, their incomes have been flat or even declining when adjusted for inflation. More money for radiologists means less money for everybody else. It's hard to understand why, but it's really a fixed pie when you get right down to the economics of healthcare in the United States. And this has led to some very hard feelings. Premise number three, and this is the one that's really the takeoff for the remainder of the presentation, increase imaging. The rise that we saw, particularly in 2000 to 2006, but well before as well before the flattening recently, I believe is a combination of appropriate growth, aberrant incentives, and maybe most significantly all of all, uncritical use. Let me go through each of these individually. In fact, imaging should be growing. It should be growing because we are an aging population. Look around you here, look up at the stage. I wasn't this old, it seemed, even yesterday. <laughs> Older people do, in fact, contract more illness than younger people, and particularly chronic diseases. Chronic diseases that are, in fact, very well diagnosed, very well staged, and the treatment well followed by uh, new imaging technologies, that is, high-tech medical imaging. It's not just the new technologies, but we've also, because of improvements as these technologies gone along, been able to address additional applications. Things like Mitch Schnall talked about when he spoke about Akron this morning, like CT colonography, like coronary uh, CT angiography. And all of this has led to less morbidity, shorter convalescence, and on a per unit basis, lower cost. But the per unit basis is not the whole story. The fact is that our technologies do not result in lower cost overall. They, re they result in additional cost almost invariably. And this is because lesser invasive, less invasive technology is used more frequently than more invasive technology. By a process of indication creep, patients who would not qualify for investigation of their signs and symptoms with the more invasive technology actually end up getting imaging exams. There are blurred indications, particularly as new technologies and new applications are coming online, where referring physicians can say, well, this sort of looks like something for which there is adequate evidence that we should use the technology. No, it's not quite the same, but why don't we give it a try? 
In the end, yes, less cost per case, but more cost overall. And this has not escaped the notice of policymakers. It's not just the cost of initial testing. There is all that downstream cost that is generated once a test has occurred. And I'm going to delve into that a little more shortly. All right, now, I think that's acceptable growth, even very positive growth, good for health in the United States of America. But there are certainly reasons, less acceptable reasons, why medical imaging use is increasing. One is that patients, generally in the United States, believe that more care is better than less care. They believe that, though, partly because we've enabled it with health insurance, the moral hazard of health insurance. What does that mean? It means that people act differently when their health care is insured than when it's not. They are, at least to some extent, and in some cases, fully protected from bearing the cost of the health care they seek. So that's probably the most significant reason. Number two, direct-to-consumer TV and print advertisements. Anybody here ever seen the ads that Siemens or GE puts on the television with high technology CT and MR scanners and patients being slid in and slid out? Why are they doing that? Do they think that you're going to go out and buy a scanner and stick it in your garage? Might happen, actually, but not very often. What they're doing those advertisements for is to convince you that when you have an ache or a pain or feel a little under the weather, you need one of those scans and you're going to go to your doctor and mention it to him or her. Boomers, I am a boomer, and as I look around, there are an awful lot of boomers here. We're quite different from earlier generations in the sense that we not only expect to live longer, as we mostly are, we expect that we're not going to see any degeneration in our faculties. And darn it, I'm one of them. I want to keep playing golf. I want to keep going fly fishing. I want to hike mountains. And that leads to a great deal of interest in medical imaging also. And then we've got the web. Most of us, I suspect, and it's not just we radiologists, when we are feeling a little down or under the weather and going to uh, our physician, we actually look up the conditions we might think we have. And this level of hypochondria, I think, is also generating additional imaging. Reason number three, less acceptable growth again. Busy physicians are misusing imaging either as a screening and triage tool or in concert with the desires of patients. They recognize that if they don't give the patient what he or she wants, that patient may go elsewhere. And in fact, there's quite a lot of combat going on for the attention of patients. It also turns out that a lot of doctors are working for corporations, hospitals included, and they're under the gun. They're being scheduled for 10, 15, 20 minutes at a shot, one patient after another throughout the day. You sit and you listen to the patient at the start. You begin to understand his or her problem. About mi minute number nine, the patient says, oh, and I really feel like I need one of those MRI scans. Is the doctor now with maybe three to four minutes left going to start to argue with the patient, or is he likely to accede to the request? It's much faster to simply order the test than to try to present alternatives. So I actually have an example of such a conversation. I know it's against HIPAA regulations, but I'm going to show you. We're going to listen in on, a, on the kind of conversation I just mentioned between a doctor and a patient. Hello, I'm your doctor. Welcome to your patient-centered medical home. How may I help you? My back hurts and I want an MRI scan. Well, we have an electronic health record. Let me look this up for you. Well, I looked it up, and you do not need an MRI. You should go away, take some acetaminophen and rest. I don't want pills or rest, I want the scan. I looked this up on the internet and I could have cancer, or a disc, or need an operation, or need to see a neurosurgeon. Why don't I have you see one of our nurses who can ask you a lot of open-ended questions, so I can go back to being a real doctor? Hey, I know you were getting paid like $9 a month to take care of me. 
How about the Enride? If I was paid $900 a month, this still would be a waste of my time. Maybe you have lupus or a rare brain tumor. Do you have lupus or a brain tumor? That would be interesting and make talking to you worth it. Maybe you should send me to a real doctor that can get an MRI scan. If I do that, we won't achieve patient-centeredness, whole person orientation, integrated care and coordination. I also will not get paid for performance and your health insurance company will lose money. National health care trends will skyrocket, electronic medical record companies will go bankrupt and to fix the budget we will need to sell California to the Chinese government. I want an MRI scan. Okay, to get rid of you, I will order the scan. I see that there is a copay of $5 for that scan. I changed my mind. I do not want the MRI scan. Goodbye. I love the bedside manner. You know, but what can you expect for $9 a month? Even less acceptable growth beyond the two others that I've already mentioned, is what economists would call principal agent moral hazard, but what we'd call self-referral. And just like patients behave differently when they have insurance than when they don't, physicians, by all the research that's been done, also are responsive to certain incentives. Imagine if you owned a CT, an MRI, a PET scanner, how much it costs to continue to operate that and pay the basic nut for that technology. And why did they put it in the office in the first place? It's not, in almost every circumstance I can mention, because there's not such technology nearby. It is because there is an opportunity to enhan enhance revenue. We thought in 1992 that the Stark laws would take care of self-referral. We were all very happy at that time, for those of you who remember back at that era. But the companies were very responsive to what we did. They saw a fairly limited market if they continued to simply sell to radiologists and hospitals, and they responded. They responded by making single-purpose machines. They minified them so that they could fit much better into offices. And they simplified it so you didn't even need a technologist anymore to conduct basic high-tech imaging. The real problem is what we see now is this principal agent moral hazard converging with patients' desire for more care. Whoops, I don't know how I ended back there. There we go. And we end up with an unholy convergence that really has an accelerating effect on imaging utilization. The physician controls the volumes of refers, referrals. The patient is protected by his or her third party insurance. And as I say, there's a spiraling effect on imaging utilization. I would say that this is unconsidered or uncritical utilization. One more, defensive medicine. Both referring physicians and radiologists play a role in the unconsidered or uncritical use of imaging for defensive medicine. In 2009, the Mass Medical Society ran a survey, and the result was that 28 percent, according to the physicians of that state, 28 percent of all imaging referrals are specifically in their mind to reduce the probability of liability uh, consequences. Now, the problem here is there's a tendency. A literature has shown that, in fact, there's a tendency to overestimate the risk of that liability, that in fact there's a tiny probability on a case-by-case-by-case -by -case -by -case basis with an independent probability in each case you see. But they think about not that probability, they think of the consequences if that one in 1,000 actually occurs. Patients are unnecessarily referred for imaging even when there is a very low chance that imaging will actually inform care or when diagnoses are very certain. Imaging does not work well. It does not provide value in those circumstances. It provides its greatest value in circumstances when there is more uncertainty. We participate, as I say. 
We are trained, most of us, to overestimate that malpractice risk just as do the referring physicians. We also learn, and it's absolutely true, that a miss is much more likely to result in legal action than an overcall. And we tend, because of that training, to work on a very high sensitivity, low specificity care, uh, form of care that leads to a great deal of follow-on testing and treatment. We recommend follow-on testing even when there is a very low probability of serious disease, both because of fear of litigation and a very pernicious practice, I hope, which is unusual. It is our analog to self-referral, which I call auto-referral or the practice of churning. So finally, now that we understand the causes, I want to get to uncritical use itself. Very simply, all imaging bears risk, and that risk is reflected in both increased cost and the possibility of patient harm. When imaging is necessary, that is being performed for the right reasons, we presume that the benefit or the potential benefit is greater than the potential risk. But unnecessary imaging bears risks and costs without any possible compensatory benefit. Here's what happens when we test individuals with marginal or really no good indication for imaging. The fact is we'll find some stuff that actually matters. And in fact, there will be patients who will get some benefit from that imaging. But the other three possibilities are false positive abnormalities, pseudo disease being identified, and the identification of incidental lomas. It reminds me actually of the, the famous Woody Hayes quote, when you pass the ball, there are three things can happen that two of them are bad. Here we've got one good thing that can happen and three of them are bad. I want to delve into each of these and start with false positive results because in fact, this, I think, is a major culprit leading to imaging abuse. We are trained, most of us, to avoid the miss even at the expense of overcalls. I have here an ROC curve. I hope it's familiar to all. Many radiologists work way out at the right end of the curve because they are so deathly afraid of that low probability of malpractice. Humiliation is an issue as well. None of us like to have some clinician come down and say, you missed so-and-so. They never come down when you overcall something, and it's hard to get sued if you overcall something as well. Nonetheless, I hope to convince you that this form of practice, this approach to practice, leads to a lot of false positive findings, and that that is as bad for our patients, and ultimately even for our practices and our image as misses. Patients, once they have a false positive diagnosis, really must go on to follow, in, follow on testing and treatment. It adds cost and it may cause harm in the form of anxiety, iatrogenic injury and exposure to the follow on testing, and radiation exposure. False positive results is all cost and no benefit. I also mentioned pseudo disease. Pseudo disease is when you hold it in your hand or you look at it under the microscope, it's real disease. But there's an enormous spectrum of aggressiveness to every disease that we know of. And some disease, even though the cellular evidence is there, will never harm the patient in their lifetime. It won't harm the patient because it's very slow growing, it's indolent growth. The patient dies of something before symptoms ever appear, or the opposite circumstance. The, the situation is the disease is so biologically aggressive that even finding it, we are not going to change the outcome. The outcome remains the same regardless of the imaging finding. Again, all cost, no benefit. And finally, we come to incidentalomas. These findings are unrelated to the condition being tested for. And there will be, of all these incidental omas, uh, a small fraction that have a real health importance and where intervention actually will improve outcome. 
We have found serious and treatable disease and we help those patients. But a much larger fraction, our literature shows us, receives a workup for benign abnormalities that will never again affect the patient's health. Once again, large cost, just as in others, but we have to admit here a small benefit. So I promised I'd eventually get to the cause of uncritical use. And just like when you trace back from a large river all the little contributory streams that lead down into it, filled with trout, at least in my dreams when I go fly fishing, uncritical use is, has multiple etiologies, but there is a single large underlying problem. And I think you probably have guessed it based on what I said at the start of this lecture. The root cause of incritical use, uncritical use, is a quixotic quest, an impossible quest for an unattainable certainty. Medicine, by definition, requires us to deal with uncertainty, but as we have moved along and as imaging has become so benign to actually perform, we keep thinking that we can override this essential aspect of medicine. Underlaying that root cause is in fact the education and culture of being physicians. All physicians are educated and nearly all are trained in academic medical centers. And there are certain characteristics of academic medical centers that are important to recognize. They have very high probability of disease in most cases because of the referral patterns. They have high severity of illness mix compared to most other hospitals and there is high intensity of care. Why does this occur? Well, that's really the bottom line here. Academic faculty, no matter how much lip service is given to the importance of clinical care and how academicians earn their living through the provision of clinical care, they're distracted by multiple missions, clinical service, education and training, the need to do scholarly work if you're going to progress in an academic career, and then, as many of us have found, you can be trapped into service and administration. So success in academics require that academic physicians somehow develop adaptive strategies. How do you handle the fact that you've got all these time-consuming things competing against each other? Or how do you actually be in two places, in two places at once? Well, the answer is simple. You supervise students and house staff. Referring physicians at most of the places, most of the academic medical centers I've ever seen conduct morning rounds. They make assignments to the various levels, everything from medical students all the way up through the senior residents and chief residents, and they entrust the house staff to make decisions or to give them a call if there's something that they really don't feel comfortable with. The house staff have a lot of talent. They've had a lot of education, but it's unlikely in most cases that they're really a match for the faculty professor. They also are torn among many responsibilities. The scut work still exists. They've got to read and study and progress in their knowledge and even they get sucked into the research and administration activities. The culture, at least in every place I know of, is it's a sign of weakness to call the attending. There's a great reluctance. And so care continues abreast until the morning rounds of the next day. What incentives does that provide? Well, first of all, do more imaging to minimize the attending's exertions, got to keep him or her happy, the wasted time that could be spent thinking but instead really needs to be occupied by the assignments, and the possibility of humiliation at morning rounds, all of this to maximize certainty. Is there any of us who either didn't personally experience this kind of humiliation where you're the example or at least we're taught by witnessing that example. The chances are that if it's happened once, you don't want it to happen again. All of this leads to a shotgun approach with little real thought, and I consider this uncritical imaging. 
There is inconsistent at best and sometimes no consideration of the two things at a minimum that everyone should consider before an imaging exam is performed. That is the performance characteristics of the test and the likelihood that disease is actually present. Now, it's bad enough that in academic medical centers this kind of approach is the norm. High acuity, wasteful even there, but these practices are taken out into community settings where there is much less probability of disease and where the intensity of care tends to be lower and everything gets magnified. The learned practice style persists for a number of reasons. Most physicians, referring physicians, do not practice alone. They join other practices where there's pressure to save time, increase throughput, and as I mentioned, imaging is used as a triage or alternative way of getting at what used to be managed much more cerebrally. It's perceived as a safeguard against malpractice liability, as I've already mentioned, and in self-referral situations will generate revenue. So those are three good encouragements. Even when there is either near certainty or near impossibility of a condition, those kinds of circumstances lead to requesting an exam by the referring physician and radiologists erring on the side of overcalls rather than chancing a miss. So what can we do about it? Well, there is some low-hanging fruit, and let me just tell you some odd ideas I have about them. The real problem is the incentive to sue, the incentive on the lawyer's part. It has led to a situation where individuals with a very reasonable case are denied a lawyer because the case isn't worth enough money and where lawyers are willing to file frivolously because there are large amounts of money at stake. What could be done? What could change the incentives to sue more appropriately? Well, first of all, couldn't they be placed on a fee schedule just like the RBRVS? Wouldn't that be a good idea? What if they had to have some skin in the game? Would they be so eager to sue on a, on a flyer if they had to pay a significant amount when they lost? Or we could cap the amount of the contingency fees, fine, 33% or whatever the heck, 40% I've heard in some cases, the lawyer gets that, but only to a certain dollar amount. Again, re reducing the incentive to sue. Now these seem like common sense ideas to me. Why don't they happen? Well, you all know that they have a very powerful lobby. People always sort of blame the Democrats. The Democrats are in the pocket of the trial lawyers. I didn't notice very much going on when the Bush administration also had a Republican Congress. It is the lobby, just as when we talk about RADPAC being our lobby for us, we're contending against a much more powerful lobby. So that's one. The other piece of low-hanging fruit is to terminate the in-office ancillary services exception to the Stark Laws. It was never intended, as I've mentioned already, that high-tech imaging be placed in the office setting. It was supposed to be old x-ray machines and primitive ultrasound machines. But you see what's occurred. Technology marches on. This is big money. And you can't tell me that even physicians don't respond to big money. It is harmful to the health, patient's health, and this rule should be, this exception to the rule, should be abolished. Again, to me it makes common sense. But once again, we are opposed by a large and powerful lobby. This is what we're fighting. Now beyond that, it gets much harder. The fact is that we're talking about long-term changes that are necessary to make imaging much more critical and much less inappropriate. The way we have to start is working with future referring physicians by teaching them elegant diagnosis. Who is the fellow in the picture, anyone? Yeah, it's William Osler, and he was the great proponent 
of thinking before you pull the trigger. It's time to revitalize that idea. The way to revitalize it is to help referring physicians not just read the abstract, but to read how the people that wrote that abstract did the work and came to the conclusions they did. Critical reading is essential if we are to begin to intercede. We're teaching the wrong stuff in a lot of our places. We're teaching them how to read a chest x-ray badly. We're teaching them the approach to looking at organs on a CT scan badly. Much more important would be to teach them how to consult with a radiologist and how to consider what might be the appropriate imaging exam if imaging is actually appropriate at all. I hope many of you saw this editorial following the Annals of Internal Medicine article naming 37 medical practices that do not improve patients' health. And this is by the editor, and I just want to very quickly read these. If we were to apply this to imaging, did the patient already have a CT scan? What's the reason for repeating it? Can, in fact, the previous test result be used? Can it be obtained and used in the care of the patient? That's one. Number two, will the test change patient care? This is exactly the thing I've been talking about. Let's think critically about it. What are the probability and negative consequences of a false positive test or pseudo disease? Let's get away from just the way overbalancing on the missed side and think about the hazards of the overcall side. What is the short-term danger of not performing the exam? That's very interesting. What about just waiting a bit? And is the reason for testing simply patient expectations or what else could be done? In the Jewish religion, there's a prayer that goes, post these words on the signposts of your house and on your gates. We have to post these on the signposts of our offices and on the gates that take us to them. The questions are being asked. It's not as though we're giving anything away here. The RBMs, uh, in many cases, are not doing the patients any good. We don't know what their block box of guidelines actually looks like. There's no transparency. And besides, that black box isn't largely what's reducing the rate of imaging use. It's the sentinel effect and the barrier effect, and I guarantee you those effects work whether the exam is appropriate or not. That's where the big reduction in utilization occurs. Clinical decision support systems, let's hope these come online. Let's hope they use the ACR criteria. But in fact, it may be that we're going to need a hard stop on these systems. We may not allow people to override them if the effect is going to occur. With regard to future radiologists, again, we must change the educational and training paradigm. I've already made a pitch for critical reading. It is just as important for our trainees as for their trainees. We have to stop explaining to the residents the fear of litigation when that risk is tiny. Or if we do, we must emphasize the risk is tiny and you have to do the best by the patient. We must discourage the reporting of findings that have little importance. Ultimately, what this means is reinvigorating the consultant role, even in the face of referring physician resistance. We must reduce the waste by contesting the marginal and inappropriate examination. We have to adopt, we have to get rid of the hedge as the national tree, and we must adopt uh, simply saying when there is small uncertainty that follow-on examination is necessary, and we must become more decisive with all of the helpful tools we now possess. On the other hand, there's a lot of imaging that doesn't get, get done that patients really should receive, and we must be advocates for this as well. All of this is by way of reducing the appearance and the reality of self-interest. The most important thing is we must become more like physicians, not shadow readers, but physicians 
who believe that every image we look at represents a patient and that we have responsibility for that patient as much as any other physician. To summarize, uncritical imaging use does have a number of different etiologies, but they all relate to that single cause, that single cause being the quest for certainty. We have to have strong concerns about what we are doing now and the anti-imaging bias that it has engendered. This is the image that some other physician groups and poly policymakers have of us. Attila, the radiologist. We have to avoid the appearance of self-interest. We have to support the policies that benefit patients, even if it means losing some of our re revenue. And we have to take the lead as consultants in making sure that this actually occurs. Once again, I want to thank Kimberly, Howard, all of you for the invitation to speak in front of you today. As I've said once or twice before, the ACR has given me some of the most interesting jobs, in fact, the most interesting jobs of my career. It's not going over the top to say that if it weren't that there was an ACR, I might have no career at all. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions if there are any. Yeah, the, the question is basically, how do, you, how do you deal with companies where there's so much pressure to make an immediate profit and that they're not looking down the line at the effect of basically making shoddy equipment or just looking at the next board meeting? And the answer is, I think the environment is telling them that. It's not just the DRA and the PAPACA. It's the recession. It's that they put their bets often in things that have not panned out very well. As I, in one, wearing one of my hats in image metrics, go from corporation to corporation to corporation, I think that they are beginning to see at least some of the companies. All right, let me qualify that. At least some of the companies are seeing that they've got to prepare for a very different kind of era long range. Otherwise, there's some just never going to listen. Yeah. This is a classic example of where, as you say, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The question was in the ER, where rather than looking at the patient, there's a protocol, depending on how they present, that dictates what gets done, including imaging. And I think that this is a terrible misuse of imaging. I do think that even in very critical situations, there ought to be time for a physician to see a patient, or at least a high-level qualified individual of some rank, to see the patient and make a determination whether that protocol is actually the right protocol. That would be the first thing. There's no way to deal with it on a national level. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat, street-to-street, door-to-door, in your institution, to convince them that this is an abuse that is bad for the patient and bad for the institution, in my opinion. Yeah.
Yeah, which, which is going on now. In fact, the ACR is working, as, as announced earlier today, is working with the company to do exactly that. Yes, Howard. Well, it's very hard, again, because of the trends in medicine where, in fact, yes, I'm sorry, once again, I, I, I'm a slow learner. Um, <laughs> if I have to state my name, it may take quite a while. Um, what Howard was asking, what were you asking, Howard? I've already blocked out. <laughs> Right. Patient expectations. When they come into the office, we recognize that that can be pernicious. And how do we deal or how do we get referring physicians to deal with the fact that what the patient is asking for may not be in his or her best interest? And the answer is it's very difficult because of the pressures these physicians are now under. Corporate medicine is a reality, particularly in uh, in, in general practice, the various forms of general practice. But there are good physicians. We have to allow that the culture will migrate, that editorials like the one I was mentioning will eventually hold sway, and that we will stand in the way when we feel it's inappropriate. That's the hard part for us. I mean, it's very hard for them, but the hard part, part for us is taking the patient's side and saying this is not the best thing that can be done with this patient. Bruce, yep. do you have any comments on the CMS proposed value modifiers as we look at you know, value, quality and cost, how we would demonstrate you know, our uh, lower cost and, and higher quality? Right. I do think we're on the right track with finally generating quality health services research. I don't know any other way to do it than to come up with data that is rigorous, that can withstand scrutiny, and that can get published, not in the JACR, fine, I'd love to have a lot of it, and I'm getting a lot of it, but that we eventually reach a level of quality where it'll be published, not for this audience, but for the audience that matters. That is the general internist, the, the specialist, and the subspecialist, and where that that data will hold sway in how, uh, how things are, are looked at. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I agree with you that uh, one way to reduce uncritical use of imaging is consultation between the radiologist and the referring physician. Educate, maybe education going both ways. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm aware. Anybody want to correct that misperception or perception of mine? Okay, next. Dan. Bruce, you know, I recognize that there's a lot of drive to try to change and you suggest that we overutilize this. There's so many pressures from the ABR in terms of how do you look at things. We don't examine on the board. Well, you should have ignored that reason. You know, why didn't you pay attention to there? I'm not. How would you affect change management at all of these multiple levels to achieve a goal which I think you know you're on the right track? How do we get there from here? Because change management is going to be the critical issue right. of how we go from point A to B. Everybody get that? All right. So what Van said was that there are all kinds of incentives in our environment. He mentioned the American Board of Radiology exams that are impeding what I'm proposing, that is to focus in on the important stuff, not to deal with low probability things, to be less in, uh, indecisive, all of that. Are, there, are, there are elements in our environment fighting that progression. I presume that many of you heard Dr. Reinertsen yesterday, and even though he wasn't talking directly to that question, what he was saying was, that we have to progress, even if it's hard, 
from the current situation to one of higher value to our patients and to society. And ultimately, the ABM's got to recognize that the, the, to ignore the little stuff. Uh, we have to recognize that we've got to ignore the little stuff and that we recognize that, in fact, just the bottom line is an overcall is as bad or worse, ultimately for the patient as a miss is. We've got to eventually have something that deals with the liability issue as well. Entirely by, I, there's no way to do it except by education. I cannot think of a reasonable disincentive that we could place in the environment. And so we have to work ground up and we have to be consultants. We have to be good consultants who actually want to reduce uncritical use. Perhaps on a, perhaps on a uh, devil's advocate basis, I'd like to challenge that. You pointed out numerous unintended consequences of uh, what we call excessive imaging. Uh, false positives, radiation, and they are clearly, they do have some negatives, but Van pointed out some of the pressures to overimage that really have some validity as well, although we may not agree with them, but they, do, they are perceived by a lot of people as having validity. What if imaging were free? What if it didn't cost? Would we even be having this conversation? I'm not sure we would. Uh, certainly there are some consequences to radiation. You, some, some people think they're magnified. Some people think they're under, underestimated. But if imaging were free, would anybody really argue about that CT scan or that MRI to detect the disc, the, my, the character? In the my very first slide said it's about the money. It's about the money. Right, let's go back to your but, first slide. But... That does not excuse the fact that there is a serious quality issue here. And I want to get away from words like overuse or misuse. I think uncritical use really is an explanation of the majority. It's unconsidered use or use where at least people are not giving reasonable thought to the likelihood that the imaging will actually improve patient care. But if it weren't for the money, no, we would not be having this discussion today. Yes, in the back. Yeah, uh, so the question is, can we learn anything from Sweden, Switzerland, Australia? I mean, Australia teaches us one thing, that's the dangers of corporatization. I don't know how much more I've learned from Australia than that. It's an interesting system. But yes, systems where there are capped budgets, I know this sounds on American systems where there are capped budgets, where there are single payers and we don't have to deal with 30% administrative costs, totally outrageous. Uh, money that really does not in any way help our system. I mean, there are all kinds of things we can learn. That doesn't mean we implement them here, but maybe we can take the best of those different things that we can learn and put them in to a system that we feel comfortable with in the American environment. Well, they think so. I mean, there are budget cuts, as an example. Uh, and budget cuts certainly decrease imaging. Do, does it decrease imaging, the right imaging? Or does it just, uh, without, uh, with a sledgehammer, does it just take money off the top? That's the worry that I have, that I think all of us have, when you use a sledgehammer instead of a scalpel. This compa comparative effectiveness research is said by those who are proponents Eventually, we'll learn what actually does work, and we simply won't do the other stuff. A billion dollars doesn't touch comparative effectiveness research, even for radiology, let alone all the rest of medicine. And so if, in fact, it's going to be comparative effectiveness research, if, in fact, there's data to support that research, it's going to take a whole lot more money before it happens. Yes, sir. Larry. before ordering the exam and learning that. I have a sister and a brother-in-law that are academic internists, and they would be here just cheering wildly for this talk because they, they, it's very, 
frustrating to them to deal with their residents that haven't answered, asked those questions and answered them uh, on morning rounds. The question I have is, there must be those kinds of people on the other side of the fence, uh, leaders within internal medicine, family practice, whatever. Is there an opportunity for us to identify senior leaders in those kinds of specialties to work jointly to attack this uh, from both sides of the equation? Yeah, I think anything we do alone is unlikely to bear much weight. I think if we do these kinds of things alone, there will, even if there's not, there will be the suspicion that we are feathering our own nest. That's the, that's the anti-imaging bias that's out there. They think we do everything only out of self-interest. One more question. Who is that, Rich? There's one over here. Ah, a couple more. Great. Can I, can I say something about that? Uh, in my practice, we've adapted RADPEER uh, to include a zero category for overcall. And that's been very helpful in pointing out one or two people in our practice who use that a little bit too much. So I think that may be a, a potential solution. Well, again, thank you so much. I've enjoyed this a great deal.